Hello, I'm Jeremy Vine, and this is Panorama. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Pilots overcome by fumes at 20,000 feet. I was paralyzed. You can imagine an aircraft with no pilots going full speed in the descent towards an airport. Holidaymakers preparing to sue over claims their health has been damaged. We got on that plane very healthy and my whole family's gotten off the plane very sick. We're still suffering symptoms to this day and I want to know why. Could the air they breathe be affecting pilots' judgment? We've got pilots confusing information from air traffic control. Passengers should be concerned. This is a potential flight safety issue. Are you already planning where you'll be jetting off to this summer, checking out the brochures and tracking down those bargain flights? If so, you'll no doubt be hoping to come back rested and relaxed. But it doesn't always turn out like that. Tonight, Panorama meets the pilots and holidaymakers who believe flying has made them ill, and they're convinced it's the air on board planes that's to blame. We're a nation that's fast becoming hooked on air travel. With cheap fares, we now take more than 56 million flights a year and spend more time in the air than ever before. Samantha Sabatino and her family from Hertfordshire used to love their exotic holidays. But that all changed early last year on Charter Flight 120 from Gatwick to Florida. We was all really excited, as you can imagine, any child going to Disney World full of beans and we all felt 100% fit and healthy and we were just really looking forward to a great holiday. About seven to eight hours into the flight, Emily said to me, Mummy, there's a funny smell in the cabin. Literally, as she said that, within seconds, she went pure white and she just violently vomited everywhere. She suspects the funny smell was toxic fumes on the plane and says she suffered severe flu-like symptoms and breathing problems for the rest of the holiday. I just felt absolutely paralysed and had wheezing and lots of crackling in the chest going, making a noise like this. Just plain, plain, plain awful. Um, I really thought something serious was wrong. You've collected quite a number of documents here. What's, what's this one? This is the um, sick passenger list that I look at the airport. As they waited to fly home, Samantha says she made a list of 31 passengers who complained they too had been unwell. I just couldn't believe it. I was absolutely astonished that so many people had gotten sick and they'd all said their symptoms had started from the plane journey out. What could have caused the passenger's illness? Doctors say Samantha didn't have an infection and, most puzzling of all, is that her family are still suffering. <laughs> There's not been one week where all the children have been at school for a full week. One's fainted at school, one's been sent home with headache and nausea. The list is endless. The children's school reports show their attendance has dropped from excellent to poor. You've got to ask yourself why. Why do all these things keep happening? and it started from that flight. How could harmful fumes get into any well-built plane and affect passengers? Look at the design. Extraordinary as it may seem, most modern aeroplanes are built so that the air supply for passengers and crew comes from the engines. And because they're operating at high temperatures, any leak of engine oil can quickly turn into a mist of chemicals and they can be breathed in by the people on board. Jet engine oil does what it says on the tin. There have been warnings about harmful chemicals that can cause paralysis or affect the nervous system. Professor Chris Van Netten, a world-respected toxicologist, has carried out studies into the hazards from these oils for more than 10 years. If there's oil leaking into the ventilation system, this is what would happen. 
First of all, there are gases being made, and one of the major gases that I measured in this is carbon monoxide, and which of course is a very toxic poison. But also you get a whole host of different components that are in the oil, including TCP or triglycerophosphates. And we know, for instance, that triglycerophosphates, that's well established, is a neurotoxin. When people say that they've suffered symptoms, nausea, headaches, respiratory problems, even inability to move, after breathing fumes on an aeroplane, is it credible that the fumes could have caused their symptoms? They may be right. The fact that they are complaining about central nervous system and, and nervous system problems would, would fit in with an exposure to triglycerophosphate or TCP. What we don't know yet is what the exposure level that might result in the symptoms that people are complaining about. We wanted to test whether toxic chemicals from engine oil can get into the air passengers and crew breathe on a normal flight. So, without asking permission, we took some samples. One of the problems of contaminated air is that you may not always be able to detect it because it can be invisible and odourless. So we're taking flights on a number of planes to make some tests of our own. On two domestic flights, we used air samplers approved by the US government and took swabs from surfaces on three planes to find out what had been left behind from previous flights. We'll learn later if there were any poisons in the air. The industry calls cases of air pollution from any source fume events, while rare, no one's sure how often they happen. Over a five-year period, Britain's Civil Aviation Authority recorded 262 of them. The main pilots' union database shows 673. The government estimate puts it much higher at one in every 2,000 flights. With 1.2 million flights a year by UK operators, that would mean 3,000 fume events in five years. It's not only passengers who could be at risk. Pilots also breathe air from the engines. If they were to become badly affected by fumes, that could put the whole flight in danger. I've been on flights where I've been on a full emergency oxygen, as has my co-pilot, yet the passengers have been left with putting paper up their noses because the fumes have been so strong. Former Captain Tristan Lorraine now actively campaigns for better air quality. These passengers aren't told what chemicals they've been exposed to and today may be suffering the effects and don't know why. There have been some frightening incidents. One happened last summer on board this British Aerospace 146 as it flew between Birmingham and Belfast with around 90 passengers on board. Two members of the cabin crew were overcome. One member of the cabin crew became violently sick to a point of collapse and almost passed out. Another one turned blue around the mouth. She also collapsed and almost uh, passed out. Both of them had to be put on action for the duration of the flight. All the crew, but none of the passengers, were taken to nearby hospitals for checkups and blood tests. Passengers were not advised of this incident, even though they were breathing the same air as the cabin crew were subsequently transferred to hospital. And there is a fear factor among cabin crew of this aircraft, the 146, because they don't know what they're being exposed to. An investigation found that oil seals had failed on two of the engines. The airline concerned says it's just one British Aerospace 146 left in its fleet, and that'll be taken out of service by the summer. Panorama has spoken to several serving pilots who've described the potentially serious effects of fumes. They won't go on the record for fear of losing their jobs. Now retired, this man will. Nine years ago, he and his co-pilot were both overcome by fumes as they started their descent into Malmo Airport in Sweden. There were nearly 70 passengers on board the British Aerospace 146 plane. Suddenly, my first officer said, I'm sick, I'm going to puke, I'm going to put my oxygen mask on. And I was very dizzy. I grabbed my oxygen mask, put it on, like so. How seriously were you impaired? Totally. I was probably five seconds from passing out. 
I was like paralyzed. I, uh, I was like uh, overcooked spaghetti. I couldn't lift my hand. And you can imagine an aircraft with no pilots going full speed in the descent towards an airport. With his oxygen mask on, Neil's co-pilot recovered sufficiently to land the plane safely on his own. 30, 20, 10. The official investigation discovered a minor oil leak in an engine. It concludes the pilots were temporarily affected by probably polluted cabin air. I saw the engine myself after landing. One of the engineers showed me where the engine is supposed to be totally clean of oil, where the bleed air is taken to go into the cabin and cockpit for us to breathe. It was just dripping of oil. Toxic gases from hot engine oil are the most probable cause of pilots being affected like this, according to Professor Van Netten. Pilots become incapacitated, most likely from an acute exposure to the carbon monoxide that's being generated under certain conditions. They're exposed to other agents as well. The combination might be a very poisonous atmosphere for them to be in. How often are flight crew in the UK affected? It depends who you ask. Campaigners say 150 fume events left British pilots impaired over six years. The Civil Aviation Authority recorded 13 fume events where pilots in UK airspace were actually incapacitated. This is the official investigation report into just one of the incidents and it makes alarming reading. The crew noticed an oily petrol-like smell. The first officer said he felt dreadful. He turned white and had highly dilated pupils. Meantime, the commander felt lightheaded, suffered from double vision, and as he was coming into land, experienced difficulty judging height. It sounds like a nightmare. Cubes in cockpit, request immediate landing. Official reports on incapacitation incidents involving other planes are equally worrying. Both the pilot and co-pilot began to experience symptoms of tunnel vision, loss of balance and loss of feeling in hands and lower arms. An emergency was declared. Confirmed clear to land. The crew missed numerous air traffic control calls. The commander did not reduce speed for landing until reminded to do so by the controller. Contaminated air is certainly a flight safety issue. There is a risk that pilots will become incapacitated and we're working towards a perfect world where that risk doesn't exist. In the meantime, we have to mitigate it. We mitigate it by people knowing through recurrent training what they need to do when there's a contaminated air event. If you were to do a gross error check in this, there are no aircraft crashes as a result, we would suggest, of cabin air quality events. So it's, it's not yet a disaster, but it is something we need to look into. While, in theory, passengers and crew on nearly all planes could suffer from contaminated air because of the nature of the design, in practice, some types of aircraft appear more prone to the problem than others. According to the database at the Pilots' Union Balper, just two planes, the British Aerospace 146 and the Boeing 757, account for 60% of recorded events in the UK. There are 158 of the planes among the 1,300 airliners registered here in Britain. Former Captain Julian Soddy retired in 2000 after flying the 146 in the final years of his long career. He says fumes in the cabin and cockpit were commonplace. That aeroplane over there, the silver one with the four intake blanks in, is a British Aerospace 146. And that's what I spent the last six years of my flying career flying. It was a delightful aeroplane to fly, but of course it did have a problem. And the problem was that when you started the aeroplane auxiliary power unit from cold first thing in the morning, frequently it would fill the cabin with black smoke. Did this ever affect the passengers? Not to the extent that I've just told you, because that, that was before the passengers got on first thing in the morning. We sometimes did get complaints uh, from the passengers via the cabin staff, but the cabin staff were so used to it that frequently they just didn't bother to tell us. Within the industry, fumes have long been recognised as a hazard. 
BAE Systems began notifying operators about problems with contaminated air and the possibility of crew incapacitation eight years ago. BAE says only a small proportion of fume events are due to oil leaks. It says it's updated 70% of oil seals and has no reports of fume events since fitting them. It says the quality of air on the 146 has been proved by independent studies to exceed all international standards. Boeing told Panorama it's committed to providing a safe and healthy cabin environment. And that studies show contaminant levels are low and health and safety standards are met. Samantha Sabatino is now preparing to sue the airline industry. She and her daughter Kelly are on their way to meet some of the 14 other passengers who've joined the legal action in America. The only thing they have in common is the flight. Eric Warner and his 13-year-old niece Mary say they too continued to suffer health problems which started after the plane journey. I had pains in my head, in my chest, in my throat, across my nose. Every joint ached. You know, I felt as if I was going to die. Mary, how did you feel when you got back home? All of my fingertips were purpley, like blotchy on the ends of them. Then after that I had a lot of sore throats, coughs and achy pains. It's all happened since we went on holiday. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm convinced that all our troubles are stemming back from then. And I think the only way you're going to get anywhere is to take it through the courts, because you're not going to get anywhere anywhere else. Yeah. I'm determined to yeah, find definitely. out the truth. Yeah, because it has affected all our lives one way or another, hasn't it? Mm. Charleston in West Virginia where the passengers' legal case is being prepared. The passengers have found an attorney specialising in chemical exposure cases. Stuart Caldwell says he's found evidence of a problem on board their flight last year. We have some confidential information regarding a fume event. Uh, we know that something was wrong and we you know... You know something went wrong on that flight, Yes. Do you? And, uh, How do you know that? Um, because we have confidential sources that indicate the mechanical uh, history, but the most compelling evidence is the consistent statements, the consistent witness observations um, from the people who were aboard that flight. The airline concerned has told Panorama there was no fume event on that flight. That'll be argued out in court. Stuart Caldwell says the case will focus on his claim that passengers have been damaged by breathing in chemicals contained in jet engine oil. Samantha and her fellow passengers exhibit unequivocally uh, signs and symptoms of acute exposure. What else explains it? There is no evidence of a viral infection, bacterial infections, most other causes that would produce the long-lasting complaints that Samantha and her fellow passengers have, have been excluded. There are pilots, too, who complain that they're suffering long-term ill health from repeatedly breathing aircraft engine fumes over many years in the air. In some cases, they say they've been made so ill, they've had to stop flying. Remember Captain Julian Soddy, who retired with ill health eight years ago? Every time I flew the aeroplane, and it gradually got worse and worse and worse, I would get severe flu-like symptoms, headache, tightness of chest, which occurred probably 15 or 20 minutes after getting airborne. What was it that led you to stop flying? My wife took me to the doctors. Uh, I sat down in his surgery in uniform and he said, if you think that I would climb into the back of an aeroplane with you as the pilot up the front in the state that you're in at the moment, you've got another thing coming. So he grounded me. Captain Soddy returned to flying after being grounded for three months but once in the air, his health problems soon returned. I wanted to fly. I've always flown. It's my life. It's what I am, not what I do. But as soon as I got into the aeroplane, well, within a few days, the symptoms started to return in exactly the same way with the same aeroplanes, which is strange. It was a very, very definite illness that was brought about by something beyond my control in the aeroplane. And I'm afraid that was it. It was hang up your helmet and goggles time. 
Captain Tristan Lorraine's career flying Boeing 757s ended two years ago after he was grounded with ill health. His doctors say his symptoms are consistent with exposure to fumes. He's taking part in research to develop a blood test which will detect chemicals found in fume events and pinpoint when that exposure happened. The idea of developing this test is to prove that passengers and crews are being exposed to triclosulfosphate, but more importantly, it will prove time of exposure. So when people have done the blood test and they present to an airline and say, I was exposed on your flight, the airline industry will be forced to deal with the problem. Current airline staff are also secretly taking part in the tests. This crew member says she was exposed to fumes just a few months ago. She doesn't want to be identified for fear of losing her job. The first warning I had was that a metallic taste in my mouth and that was basically on takeoff. Soon after there was that really strong smell of burnt plastic. I felt my chest was burning. I started coughing. I lost my voice. The burning sensation in my chest, I had it for about two months after that. Why have you come to have your blood taken for testing today? Because I don't know whether those symptoms I have are going to be reversible or if something else in a few months or in a few years' time is going to happen and I, I want to understand what's going on. Are you worried about this? Of course I am. We know that cabin fume events take place. We know that flight crew get sick. What we don't know is whether they're linked and what that link is because the jury is out as to what's happening. The individuals themselves believe that it has been caused by a fume event and that's what our research now is looking to try and establish. What does happen and how do we put it right? Confirm clearance for landing. Some pilots claim it's not only their health that's at risk but flight safety too. They suffer short-term memory loss while at the controls. This pilot only stopped flying recently and doesn't want to be identified. Um, we can be given a clearance. For example, we can be cleared to land the aircraft. If the clearance is given quite a long way from the point of landing, we'll have forgotten if we've received that clearance. So we just throw our hands up in the air, check the runway's clear and land. Both pilots can be in the state where they simply can't remember if they've been cleared to land as they are approaching the runway. That's correct. 36 pilots who believe they've been affected by fume events have been tested by a leading clinical psychologist. What we're asking people to do is to join up some dots which have numbers and letters in them in ascending order and I'm going to time you and see how quickly you can do it. Dr Sarah Mackenzie Ross carried out a series of psychometric tests to analyse their mental functions. She's published results on how the first 18 handled the puzzles. Well done. What did you find with the pilots when they tried this test? We found that a substantial number um, were performing below average and much below the level we'd expect given their level of intelligence. There were some certain areas in which they were weak and these were to do with the ability to hold information in memory for short periods of time, the ability to switch their attention between different tasks. Dr Mackenzie Ross believes these flaws could damage pilots' flying ability. Passengers should be concerned and that this is a potential flight safety issue. We've got pilots saying that they're struggling to remember or they're confusing information from air traffic control. They're feeling mentally slowed down and they're struggling to shift their attention between different tasks. And yet these are the very skills that we require pilots to have. Half the pilots who found these problems in your tests are still flying. That's correct. Half the pilots we saw were either retired on ill health grounds or on sick leave, but half of them were still working. So does her research back the pilots' claims that their problems are caused by toxic fumes? My conclusion is there's definitely something wrong with these pilots. We've been able to exclude common causes for it. The pilots are concerned that it may be exposure to toxic fumes in the aircraft. And certainly the pattern and nature of the difficulties they report is consistent with that seen in other groups of people who've been exposed to chemicals that are potentially toxic to the nervous system. Her findings went to a government committee examining cabin air quality. 
Its expert calls the research excellent, but points out it wasn't designed to prove what caused the pilot's problems. The committee says that immediate health symptoms from fume events are plausible, but it's not possible to conclude there's any link to longer-term ill health in air crews. So what are we passengers breathing in on everyday flights? Our secret air and swab samples from a Boeing 757 and a British Aerospace 146 have been analysed. These seemed perfectly ordinary flights with no fume events. Yet all our tests, air and swab, came back positive. We were exposed to the organophosphate TCP on both flights. This means that when you were in the plane, you were inhaling this level of TCPs. So what does this show you about the possibility of engine oil getting into the air that passengers and crew breathe? This proves the fact that the oil from the engine gets into the air, and this is what you have been breathing during this flight when you took your sample. The pathway is there, that engine oil gets into the air and people are exposed to it. Now, what's important here now, what are the quantities? The levels of the toxic chemicals found were very low, well within international safety standards. Yet, they're still of concern to Professor Van Netten. The international standards are based on non-aircraft situations. We have to really be careful not to jump to conclusions when you say, well, this is a very low concentration. It's a low concentration, but in combination with many other things. If there is a fume event, you're exposed to much higher quantities of the tricrystal phosphates. Boeing told Panorama, as you're making clear, these levels are very low and well within current international safety limits. BAE systems say our sample is one thousandth of the limit prescribed in the UK health and safety standard for long-term exposure. And they say an earlier study into cabin air concluded it was inconceivable the extremely low levels of oil contamination found could cause organophosphate symptoms. Boeing's new Dreamliner comes into service next year. The company told the House of Lords it will eliminate the possibility of oil fume events because the cabin air doesn't come from the engines. Eventually, all planes could have air supplied this way. Until then, passengers and crew will just have to accept they risk breathing in oil fumes when they fly. I feel sick coming. I just had to get out. And my head was my head was numb, my legs were numb. I want to know what has made my children sick. There's so many problems that we didn't have before. So many different types of things affecting the body from top to bottom. I want people to recognise that there's a problem going on and I want answers. Samantha Sabatino ending Jerry Northam's report. And you might be interested to know that the government has now started its own tests into the air we breathe in planes in what they say is the first research of its kind. And their initial results are showing they too have found the neurotoxin TCP in the samples.